Welcome to the Campaign TV show, the podcast. I am your host and your brother, Brother King Cam. And today I have a special guest, special, special guest um, that I'm honored to have on the platform to discuss and talk with us today about some of the current topics that are plaguing our community. Um, and really, this brother can go without any introduction because of his beautiful, beautiful work. But what I want to do is talk about how our brother is a student minister, part of the research team for the Honorable Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan, and does a wonderful, wonderful job in defending the minister, and Brother Demetri Muhammad. Could you please let the people know exactly a little bit more about yourself, sir? Brother Zaki, thank you so much for the great privilege and the opportunity to be here with you tonight, my brother. As you pointed out, I'm Brother Demetri Muhammad, a student minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings under the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I work, uh, have worked for the last 10 years as a part of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's research team. And Allah has blessed us to travel extensively throughout the country lecturing in mosques and churches, community centers, schools, and wherever we can have a platform with which we might share the life-giving teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And so we, of course, uh, have a website, which is researchminister.com, and uh, have published several books, uh, the latest of which is the first book uh, in 55 years that is an official response from the Nation of Islam regarding the assassination of Malcolm X. And so, uh, and of course, we've also written uh, about the phenomenon regarding the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the high profile and prominent men and women who adore him or admire him and believe in him. And that is, of course, germane to some of the issues that swirl around uh, in the news media, even as we speak. So uh, I'm very grateful for the privilege and opportunity to be here with you tonight, my brother. And I appreciate the work that you do in defending the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and helping to share critical knowledge, wisdom, and understanding uh, with our people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Brother Dimitri. It's a, it's a pleasure, like I mentioned, um, to have you on the platform to discuss these things. Uh, so one thing is I watched the interview that you did with uh, Brother Ben X, and it was beautiful. And the way uh, you guys started off uh, with words from the minister, I thought was key. And I believe uh, we should do the exact same thing because um, that sound bite kind of lays the foundation uh, for what we're gonna be discussing today. So what I wanna do is I'm gonna pull that up really quick so that the people can hear the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan himself. And then we can go ahead and segue into uh, what we're gonna to discuss today. Because there's a lot of people saying stuff, but a lot of people don't really get to hear what the minister said. So we have to parse his words first. So let me go ahead and get that screen up. All right, so can uh, everybody see that? Can you see that, Brother Demetri? I can see it, yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. All right, so we want to play the words from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan right here. On the brightness of his coming. Read it! It's this that they fear. Yes, sir. I don't have no army. I just know the truth. And I'm here to separate the good Jews from the satanic Jews. Yes, yes, yes. This is just the beginning, banning me from a social platform. I use that platform with respect. Yes, sir. I never allowed those 
those who follow me to become vile as those who speak evil of us. So I am dangerous, not to you, unless you feel that Father Flager's invitation to me may hurt St. Sabina. They don't have the power to hurt St. Sabina if you don't give them that power. I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, sir. I have not said one word of it. No, sir. I do not hate Jewish people. That's right. Not one that is with me has ever committed a crime against the Jewish people. Black people, white people, don't matter what your color is. As long as you don't attack us, we're not bothered. Right. Right. Oh, praise the people of Allah. That right there is the words of the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan himself. And, you know, oftentimes, especially in today's time, People have not had the opportunity really to hear what the minister has said about the feud that he's having uh, with the so-called Jew. People hear sound bites. They hear what's put out in the mainstream media. Uh, they are masters of taking his words out of context and switching them around. They are masters at claiming that he's talking about all the Jews and using it as a general term. So there were a few things that the minister highlighted and he talked about how they don't have the power to stop St. Sabina if we don't give them that power. So I think that's a, a good uh, jumping board for you to go ahead and get in. Uh, Brother Dimitri, uh, what are your thoughts uh, on that? Well, Brother Zaiki, I, I wanna thank you for you know sharing the minister's words because uh, not enough people have heard from him directly. Uh, and so I'm very happy that we were able to begin our conversation, you know, with getting it directly from his blessed mouth. Uh, and I think that everything that the minister shared in that clip uh, is 1000% the truth. We have entered into a period of time that the scriptures refer to as the day of resurrection. The day of resurrection is also a day of judgment. In fact, about it, it is from the perspective of the Holy Quran that uh, Satan's rulership uh, would be until the day when they are raised. So from an Islamic theological perspective, there is the expectation of the occurrence of a time wherein men and women, not in physical graves, but in mental and spiritual graves, will be resurrected and will be awakened. But this is once and at the same time, a period of time of judgment because Satan, as well as God, the truth of Satan, and the truth of God will be made known to the public so that for the first time, the public is able to and empowered to make a decision. Who do they want to be allied with, God or Satan? And so I believe that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is the instrument of God in bringing about the resurrection of humanity that is a resurrection that begins in earnest among the lowest members of the human family. The downtrodden, the Bible refers to them or us 
as the despised and the rejected, the robbed and the spoiled, the black people of America. So Minister Farrakhan's work is of import and value, certainly to us who are Muslims in the nation of Islam. It is of import and value to black America for he has been our most ardent and gallant defender against all of our adversaries. And his work is of import and in, in value to all of the human family. So this controversy that the minister is currently engaged in, I hope we get a chance to get into some of the details of it because it is important for our community to understand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm glad you mentioned getting into the details because that's exactly what I wanted to segue into next is because obviously people heard about Deshaun Jackson and his Instagram posts and uh, the backlash he received from his Instagram posts that not only included the, uh, the, the, the quote that was attributed to Hitler, but also his other posts that featured the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So when he was, when the pressure was applied to him, all of the posts came down, not just the one about Hitler uh, that, that they say was attributed to Hitler, but also the minister's post. And then you see the attack on Nick Cannon. You see the attack on uh, anybody else who decided to put uh, either help promote the minister's lecture on the, uh, the on July the fourth, or even show any love towards the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Stephen Jackson was attacked. Alan Iverson was forced to apologize. Dwayne Wade apologized for tweeting love and support for Nick Cannon, and he wasn't even directly involved. And then Dwayne Wade issued an apology for giving a tweet of support of his brother. So could you talk about um, this domino effect of black men standing up on truth and then being pressured into apologies? Well, you know, Brother Zaki, uh, a few years ago, I wrote an entire book uh, discussing the phenomenon whereby the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is loved, respected, and admired by some of the most high profile people in America and around the world. And I only mention that because this is not really new uh, that people of stature, people who are in the mainstream, quote unquote, people who are wealthy, people who are influential, that they privately and some publicly express admiration and love for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. However, just to give a brief historical overview, just to help you know the, the audience to understand and have some important perspective because history is always a frame for us so that we might achieve the proper perspective. And so what you have is going all the way back really to 1977, if I could start there, because that's when Allah blessed the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan to stand to begin to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the Nation of Islam. And the minister, as he went about his work, he didn't want to be public. He went, I believe, seven years where he would travel throughout America. He would attract followers. He would commission the establishment of study groups. And he did this without a lot of attention. He didn't want a lot of attention. Well, in 1983, this was the 20th anniversary of Dr. King's March on Washington. And many of the prominent people in the black movement and civil rights world, they knew of the minister, even though he wasn't at that time uh, necessarily a household name. Uh, so he was invited. He was invited to speak at the 20th anniversary of the March on Washington. And the minister only spoke for about six minutes near the end of the day. But his message was so impactful that uh, several uh, uh, newspapers were writing about, you know, who is this guy that we never heard of? And they were interviewing people in the crowd and so forth. And because of the minister that day, he gave the greetings 
assalamu alaikum and thousands of people reply wa alaikum salam <laughs> you know and so you know many in the mainstream press they were scratching their heads because you know from their vantage point the nation of islam was no more and so that was you know as 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 nature teaches us you know whenever things grow the root goes down first and then the little shoot pops up out of the ground that was the little shoot that popped up out of the ground of the budding and the rebuilt nation of Islam. And so going on over into 1984, the minister was asked by Reverend Jesse Jackson if he would help him run for the office of the presidency of the United States. Because Reverend Jackson, like many in the black community, because he identified with the struggle of the Palestinian people many in the Jewish community disagreed with that and they began to oppose Reverend Jackson's campaign. And some groups like the JDL, the Jewish Defense League, as well as Fern Rosenblatt's Jews Against Jackson, they uh, were very aggressive in their opposition to Reverend Jackson. And there were some of Reverend Jackson's campaign offices that were actually firebombed. And so at this point, the minister uh, dispatched and assigned members of the Fruit of Islam to be personal security for Reverend Jackson and his family. And the minister, as he would go around as something of a surrogate speaker, if you will, for the campaign, he would defend Reverend Jackson. And when these Jewish groups began to oppose him, he challenged them. And after he defended Reverend Jackson, it was then that he began to be publicly uh, identified as anti-Semitic where Nathan Perlmutter of the ADL and Nat Hintoff of the Village Voice for the first time called our beloved minister a black Hitler. And so mm -hmm. from that point forward, they began to attack anything that the minister uh, put his hand on. Uh, come up to 1994, Brother Zaki, 94 is very significant because I argue that what is happening with Nick Cannon, Deshaun Jackson, et cetera, uh, was actually planned uh, in 1994. And it was uh, documented in a report called Mainstreaming Antisemitism, The Legitimation of Louis Farrakhan. There, Stephen Freeman wrote that even though the Nation of Islam fills a void in the black community, uh, they said that they still don't like Farrakhan, in other words. And they, you know, proposed at that time that since they knew that they could not stop the minister, that they would seek to isolate the minister by punishing uh, and humiliating any prominent persons or groups who gave Minister Farrakhan a platform. And, of course, right after that, 1995, you have the Million Man March, yes. an overwhelming event, overwhelmingly successful, where Allah's anointing on the minister touched the hearts of our people, and nearly two million showed up. The minister, after that, he became someone that was virtually non-existent in terms of the mainstream media because they adopted a policy of non-coverage of Minister Farrakhan. Minister mm -hmm. Farrakhan could go to any city in America and tens of thousands of people would show up and you wouldn't see any coverage of it in the local newspaper. This was wow. a departure from their previous policy of negative coverage. But the Million Man March proved to them that Minister Farrakhan was a man that benefited even from negative coverage. So after the march, they adopted a policy of no coverage at all. And so from maybe 96 onward, many people thought that the minister was non-existent because they could not find him in mainstream news outlets. Then that brings us to the advent of social media, Brother Zaki. Mm. When social media had its birth, maybe in 07, 08, I don't remember, but it was during that period of time where brothers like Brother Jesse Muhammad, who is now known as Abdul Qiyam Muhammad, yes. he began to... Uh, organized believers uh, through using the social media platform Twitter. And because of his uh, dogged determination 
and his commitment to establishing a place for his teacher and ours, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan on social media, the minister literally was able to escape a veritable prison of public opinion based upon the ADL's isolation and marginalization, marginalization strategy. So with terms like trending and, and uh, viral, you, you saw Minister Farrakhan burst back onto uh, the stage for many people. Uh, many people who didn't know him became introduced to him. Many mm -hmm. people who had forgotten about him began to remember him. And so it was during this last uh, period of years where we have seen groups like the Anti-Defamation League, Southern Poverty Law Center, Simon Wiesenthal Center, step up their campaign. campaign. And so anytime a prominent person, someone who has a large platform, wants to share that platform with the minister, they are punished. And so Nick is being punished, Deshaun is being punished. Uh, they want to punish those who are supportive of a man whom they have deemed to be persona non grata. And essentially, as I said, I believe on another program, I, I would hope that our community, Brother Zaki, would, you know, because people always say, well, man, I'm not a Muslim. Well, I don't agree with everything Farrakhan say. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, you don't agree with everything your mother says. And yet she went through the pain of death to give you birth. You don't agree with everything your wife or your husband has to say. Yet you would never allow anyone to assault or attack mom, dad, wife, husband, son, daughter. So let's put our ideological differences to the side. And our community should rally to the support of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan because we should demand the right, as every other community of people has, Brother Zaki, to pick and choose our friends, to pick and choose our leaders, and to love who we want to love. And if there's a man that speaks out from amongst us against the forces that oppress us, it's not intelligent, Brother Zaki, mm. for us to expect our oppressors to approve of our liberator. Mm. There could not be a greater, more stark conflict of interest than the interest in between the oppressor and the liberator the enslaver and the liberator of the enslaved. And so that's essentially what we have here. We demand that we, re we reserve the right to love Minister Farrakhan, to follow Minister Farrakhan, in spite of what anybody else got to say about it. Yes, sir. Well, that was beautiful, uh, Brother Demetric, and how you laid that out. Uh, because I agree with you 100%, obviously, because in this time, looking at the condition of our people, we are definitely in need of a liberator. And speaking on our people and the relationship, the uh, love-hate relationship, and I actually listened to Sister Janita on Doing the Math, and she talked about how either when the Honorable Minister Farrakhan name is brought up, it's either those who love him and follow him and will, uh, you know, who, who, who have an infatuation with him and how he saved their life. Or you have the total opposite of those who speak negative of him or say vile things about him or um, seek to discredit him. So there is a relationship that... Um, exist in the black community as it pertains to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. But I want to uh, bring up some of these, art, one of these articles that was uh, written by one of our people, our sister, uh, Jamel Hill. She wrote an article as it pertains to Deshaun Jackson talk, and it says uh, the anti-Semitism we didn't see. And Deshaun Jackson's Hitler moment in mind showed that black uh, Americans experience of racism doesn't automatically synthesize us towards other forms of prejudice. 
I want to scroll down just a little bit because I want you to talk about this mindset and what Jamil Hill had to say here where she says, like Jackson, I am black. And had anyone made a remark trivializing slavery, I would have been incensed. I learned that just because I am aware of the destruction caused by racism, that doesn't mean I'm automatically sensitive to other forms of racism, or in this case, anti-Semitism. Black people, too, are capable of being culturally ignorant. Now, I found that peculiar in the sense because she talked about being anti-Semitic. So I want you to first uh, clear up anti-Semitism or being anti-Semitic. What does that mean? Because a lot of the, our people in the community hear this term and they associate it pot more than likely with the Honorable Miss Louis Farrakhan, but they can't really give you a definition if you ask them. And then could you go into the mindset that Jamel Hill uh, is showing as it pertains to Black people being culturally ignorant? Yes, sir. <clears throat> I want to first start with, you know, as you referenced what Sister Janita uh, said, because I think it's it's a and it's an important point to, to, to add into the other two questions. And that is the point of how the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is either spoken of by those who love him intensely or spoken of by those who hate him intensely. And so he is in that regard a very polarizing figure. And uh, this is uh, important because this is how the scriptures uh, describe the work of the Messiah. And I bear witness that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is a messianic presence among us. His work is salvific in nature. And so as it was described of the Messiah in the scripture, somewhere refers to him as a stone of stumbling. And I literally read a headline to a Forbes article condemning the minister just the other day, referring mm -hmm. to how black and Jewish relationships keep stumbling over this one man. Mm -hmm. And so even in the uh, observations like that, uh, that our dear sister made, uh, those of us that have studied the scriptures, you know, we understand that you know, that's not language that organically comes from the mind of people. That is language that God has given them to speak to help to show the world the true identity of his servant. Now, you asked about anti-Semitism, and that's a very good question. You asked about the mind of Jamel Hill. That's a very good question. Because Jamel Hill, like a lot in the black community, I would dare say, are uh, really uneducated on this subject. You know, uh, Professor Andrew Hacker wrote a book some years ago about how America, even though people like to claim we're in a post-racial time period, he wrote a book talking about two Americas, one black, one white, one rich, one poor, separate but unequal. And so in the black community, we live in the hood. We live among our own primarily. Of yes. course, they're members of the various immigrant groups that have businesses or what have you. But, you know, they make their money and then they go and they live in their own communities, you know. So we are not really astute in a very complex and often nuanced, but for sure a very sensitive subject of Black Jewish relationships. And that's compounded by the fact that we have lost our appetite as a people for reading. We used to pride ourselves at one point in time on what we had read. Now we live in a world where we pride ourselves on what video we have watched. Yes, sir. And so, yes, sir. you know, we, we kind of fulfill that old saying, Brother Zaki, if you want to hide something from a black man or black woman, just put it in a book. In a book. So we've we've got yeah. brothers, brothers like yourself like and myself, myself. We are up we are against up that, that, you know, challenge and that issue. Uh, that our people, by and large, are not readers as we should be. 
So our sister began to talk about and reference our minister, you know, as an anti-Semite, you know, it was almost kind of like, like, you know, somebody from the black community saying that Dr. King is anti-white or that Malcolm X was anti-white, you know, the right. reaction to oppression and injustice coming from the oppressed is not anti the ethnicity of those who are oppressing them. It's not anti the religion of those who are oppressing them. It is anti-oppression. Mm. Minister Farrakhan speaks out against black oppression. Mr. Farrakhan speaks out against male oppression of the female. He speaks out against white oppression, against Jewish oppression. Because when you have been oppressed and when you have suffered, you speak out against that. Now, from a scriptural perspective, Brother Zaki, the Holy Quran says this, Allah, God, hates the utterance of hurtful speech, except in the case of one who has been wronged. That's the English translation. So it helps us to wrap our mind around why revolutionary leaders, why even prophets and messengers use a kind of language that some who hear that language deem it to be hurtful or insulting or offensive because this is what Allah permits to be expressed from those who have been hurt. But it is also given by Allah to prophets and messengers to sternly rebuke the sinful, the wayward, the errant, and the corrupt in terms of nations and civilization. So a sister like Jamel Hill, she is by and large uneducated with respect to this subject. It would be wise for those when they don't have knowledge of a subject to refrain from speaking on that subject. However, we understand that some of our brothers and sisters who are prominent feel that in order to uh, maintain that position of prominence, that they have to make certain statements, that they have to buy in to a certain party line, you know, and the party line of mainstream America is that Farrakhan is persona non grata. In other words, Farrakhan is not welcome in the mainstream anywhere. So it's unfortunate that our sister made that characterization of our minister. It's unfortunate that our sister feels that way about her own people because it's, it's actually not true. Um, you don't have any kind of history of black people being anti-Semitic, committing acts of violence against the Jewish community. You just don't have that in history. So her point of reference is not based in history. Her point of reference is based in politics. Mm. Um, secondly, you wanted to say something about what is anti-Semitism. Yes, sir. Well, anti-Semitism is a term that, you know, literally means uh being anti the semitic people now when you look into most dictionaries there are many different people who are considered to be semitic not just the jewish people and some of those people are people of color people that you and i descend from so to be anti-semitic means that you are working to oppose and to deny of rights and privileges Semitic peoples. It has become a political weapon, however. It has become a tool that is a part of the character assassination and the ritual defamation of anybody that criticizes misconduct from the state of Israel or criticizes misconduct 
coming from the Jewish community. In fact, a former Israeli education minister, a woman by the name of Shulamit Alani, did an interview with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! And she said, well, you know, that's a trick that we use to silence our critics. If it's in America, we, we, we label them as being anti-Semites. If it's in Europe, we label them as being Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. So this highly placed member of the Israeli government uh, revealed that to Amy Goodman before the world. And we can bear witness that that's the case with Minister Farrakhan. Brother Zaki, if you or I, as registered members of the nation, if we wanted to go and do harm to some Jewish people, which we don't, the minister would disown us. He would put us out of the nation. We are people that don't believe in being aggressors. We are people that don't carry firearms. We are people that if you carry a firearm, you will be suspended from amongst our ranks. So how could we be a group that's anti-Semitic simply because we are looking at facts, history, and evidence that the relationship between the black community and the Jewish community has not been one of mutual brotherhood and respect, has not been mutually beneficial. So as the minister exposes this history, he becomes dubbed an anti-Semite. But, you know, most people in our community don't even know what that is, you know, but most people in our community, thank God, view the nation of Islam in our true respect as a community of brothers and sisters who are very concerned about the condition and welfare of our people and are courageous enough to speak the truth even when that truth is uncomfortable. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and I would like to add to that, just as it pertains to this platform, the reason why I work so hard to try to establish a platform like this is so that we could have a voice to give our people the opportunity to hear outside of just coming to the mosque, but hearing our perspective, hearing the side of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and more often than not, too, also hearing from the scholarship, from Black scholarship, because that is something that's very, very important. The Black scholarship that we know of, and it's no disrespect to um, brothers um, like Cornell West and uh, Michael uh, Eric Dyson and uh, those beautiful brothers, but those brothers have more of a mainstream scholarship outside of the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. See, when you had the teachers, you're able to connect the rest of the scholarship that you get together to bring it full circle. And I, I think we, uh, in this uh, time frame, don't have as many uh, platforms to allow us to have that voice. So it was important that we establish uh, this one along with the other ones that uh, are up now. Uh, again, I see uh, yourself, Dr. Wesley uh, and other uh, brothers and sisters across the nation being able now to speak to these points because one of the things that I noticed was they, the enemy would put out something and they would try or have the ability to muffle our response. So I think it's uh, beautiful that we have the opportunity to have these discussions, social media allowing us to be able to keep putting the minister out there. So when they say certain things, then you can put a clip of the minister out there to refute that. Or you could put a clip of yourself or Dr. Wesley or Minister Nuri to refute some of these things that they say. And then you have, uh, as Jamel, you have Jamel Hill, recently Charles Barkley, and all of these people coming out uh, in defense of black people being anti-Semitic. So I, I believe this conversation is much needed uh, and it's uh, very, very much appreciated. Also, while we're still on the subject of anti-Semitism, anti there, and the minister mentioned it in, in one of his lectures that he did at Moss Marion, where he uh, named a list of black entertainers and black political figures that were listed anti-Semitic. That included Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jackson, uh, uh, who, who else was on that list? Oh, Barack Obama, 
there were a, a whole still list. Martin Luther King Jr. There were a lot of Malcolm X, a lot of black leaders that we love today, that our people adorn today as being sometimes our people say they, those were the only real leaders we have. It's the ones that have been uh, assassinated, but they don't know that they was actually labeled anti-Semitic at the time of their rise. As they became more prominent, they were actually given the anti-Semitic tag the same as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan today. So that should show us, family. That should show us how much they fear the wisdom of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan when they give you that anti-Semitic tag because they gave it to Martin Luther King once he realized that economic, that economically we could withdraw from this system and we could start to make an impact. When Malcolm started to expose certain things, they labeled him anti-Semitic. When Michael Jackson started to wake up and started to put certain things in his music, started to speak out against Hollywood, then he was labeled anti-Semitic. When Barack Obama initially did not agree with some of the policies that pertain to Israel, they label him anti-Semitic. So we have to take these conversations and really internalize them and understand what's really happening here and how important the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is. And I want to segue that into your book, But Didn't You Kill Malcolm X? Which I think is very important because our people still are conflicted about how that whole scenario panned out, the relationship that Malcolm had with the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the role that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan played at that time. So could you uh, speak to that and, uh, and talk about the new book? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for, for bringing it up, uh, Brother Zaki. Uh, and I just wanted to, to say, to, to dovetail off of, you know, your earlier point, um, we have an article in this week's issue of the Final Call newspaper uh, entitled In Good Company, how the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is among uh, the great black heroes and heroines of our struggle uh, by being opposed by Jewish groups. There's certainly some nuance and specificity with what they are doing to the minister. But on a certain level, what they're doing to the minister is the same that they did to all of our great ones, as you pointed out. So that should help us as a people and as a community not to get our feathers ruffled uh, and acting different and wanting to distance ourselves from our leaders just because they have been labeled an anti-Semite. It could mean that such a leader is poised for greatness because he is attracting to himself the same opponents of the leaders that went before him who we consider to be great today. Um, and in this, you know, I don't care what the, the issue is. I don't care what the, the circumstances are. You have people who are internet trolls, bots, or whatever you want to call them, who comment section, that comment section, they will be all off the topic and they will say, well, Farrakhan killed Malcolm X. Now, in our book, we expose the history of how that mythology got started because that wasn't always a part of the strategy in the media of opposing the nation of Islam. Early on, they blamed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan's name was never brought up. But in 1994, we discussed how this began again. Uh, and then there, there's that year again, 1994, with Stephen Freeman's report for the ADL, uh, because this was a time period, late 80s, early 90s, when the rebuilding of the nation was really ramping up. So much so, Brother Zaki, that in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, in 1992, Minister Farrakhan spoke at the Georgia Dome 
and I believe 60,000 people came out to hear from him. The World Series was being played in another arena across town. And Minister Farrakhan had more people to come and hear him than did was people that went to see the World Series. So the enemies of our community were scrambling. What are we going to do about Farrakhan? And so they began to plot, they began to plan. And unfortunately, a lot of people believe and have bought into the propaganda. Uh, they have had a certain degree of effectiveness in making people to believe the minister has something to do with Malcolm's assassination. But for 30 years, the name Louis Farrakhan was never brought up in association with the assassination of Malcolm X. It's only brought up during a period of time where it appeared that he had successfully done what no other black organization in the history of America had done. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI worked to destroy a lot of black organizations and movements, and hardly any of them, if any of them, were able to rebuild from the ashes of ruin. But it was the anointed servant of God, the man that Allah raised to rebuild the work of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was singularly successful in that regard. And so since he did what was really the improbable and the impossible, they didn't have a plan ready. So they had to begin to invent a plan. So the punishing of his friends, the mythology that he is somehow responsible for Malcolm's assassination. All of this became a part of the propaganda campaign to destroy the rebuilt nation of Islam, which would deprive black America of the kind of strong and uncompromising leadership that the nation of Islam uniquely provides. See, we had to always remember, Brother Zaki, the minister and the nation are hated by the powers that be because of our beneficial impact on our people whom they want to kill. They are genocidal plots against the black community of America. And when you have a man like Minister Farrakhan and his students sounding the alarm, the scripture refers to a good minister or a good preacher as one who is a watchman on the wall. So the minister in the nation uh, exist in that role and function uh, among our people. And so because of that, we have to speak uh, truths that are not politically correct all the time. We have to expose the hidden hand of Satan much of the time. And this is the root cause of why the minister in the nation is hated. If the minister and the nation were truly anti-Semitic, you would be able to point to a long record of crimes or hate crimes that resulted from the minister's preaching. However, I cite in my book, Rabbi Bruce Kahn, Baltimore, who attended the Million Man March and talked about how loved and respected he felt on that day and how Minister Farrakhan's followers don't go out and harm Jews or white people because the minister teaches against that. And that's only tangential to his overall message. See, so we are blessed to, even in the book on Malcolm X, to bust up the myth of anti-Semitism. We're able to go into and deconstruct all of the myths, the myths about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life, the myth about the reasons why Malcolm really left the nation, the myth about the role of the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai Brit, all of these things, we believe that we have done uh, a great job of deconstructing these myths, that once you deconstruct the myths, the Nation of Islam and its leadership walk out of a prison of public opinion being exonerated. And that's a beautiful point because I think that, again, it's important that we have these conversations so that we have the ability to defend our positions. I think oftentimes, as you mentioned, we have to speak some unpopular truths. Oftentimes we have to say things that are not politically correct all the time, but we have a certain job that we are doing. And most of the message and 
of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan is the upliftment of black people. As you can see through the, the work and the results of his teaching, of his preaching, is that it resurrects and cleans up the black man and the black woman. You know, there's a very small portion of it that deals with the truth of our open enemies, which is a necessity because that's part of the cleansing of the mind. Because our mind has been sullied. Our mind has been soiled being born and being a part of white supremacy. So this washing of the mind has to take place. But it's a very small part in the overall self-improvement, which is the basis for community development, which is the bulk of the message of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam. And one thing I like about your book, as I started to get into it, it gives a unique perspective because most people are either with Malcolm or against Malcolm. You have people that uh, speak on the subject and they are on a side. Somebody's picking a side. But in your book, you give an overall perspective from both sides of the table. And I think that's important because it's not a book or a perspective that vilifies Brother Malcolm. And it's also not a book that vilifies or points the finger at the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan or the Nation of Islam or the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. But it simply lays out the facts. And as it lays out the facts, you're able to look at the facts as a good attorney does in a court case lays out the truth of the facts and then allows the judge to go through the evidence. And then the judge is able to make a logical and a educated decision based on the information provided in front of him. See, for years we have been given a one-sided view. As one of my favorite lines in Bad Boys, the first one, when they was talking about how the news got a slant when Marcus and Will got caught up with, with the girl in the, and, and his wife was trying to figure out where Marcus was at. He was like, the news got a slant to it. That's real because all of the information and stuff that's been coming out about the Nation of Islam and about Malcolm X and all of that stuff had a slant to it. And it was geared towards throwing mud on our name because they're is a relationship that exists with the Nation of Islam and our work to resurrect our people, which diametrically is opposed to white supremacy. So if we are allowed to operate freely and do our work, then that means that their power is completely over with. So I think it's extremely important that those who have questions about the assassination of our brother Malcolm X, you get this book. My brother, Minister Dimitri, because it's not a biased book. This is not a book that is coming specifically from a nation of Islam perspective, but it's a book that takes all of the people, all of the circumstances, all of the evidence and lays it before the people. And then you have the ability now, even with Brother Malcolm's words, because people want to dismiss Brother Malcolm's words sometimes. Or some people don't know that Brother Malcolm had words. So they have right. to be laid out to hear what he had to say about his relationship with the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So we are coming up on time. We have only a few minutes left. Could you go ahead and uh, close us out, Brother Dimitri, with um, maybe some uh, some sneak peeks in the book, um, things like that, and then go ahead and, uh, and close us out there, Brother. Well, you know, Brother Zaki, you did such a wonderful job, man. You know, I'll have to get you to do a commercial or something for the book because you really hit the nail on the head. And I think that, you know, in a certain part of the book, we talk about the false choice that the public is given. You know, if you love the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you got to hate Malcolm X. If you love Malcolm X, you got to hate the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan. And so I reject that false choice and show how we can be loved in love and respect Brother Malcolm, as well as Minister Farrakhan and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the nation. And that's not something that I'm inventing. That's me trying to reflect the heart, the spirit, the attitude, and what I have learned from the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And, you know, the minister loves Brother Malcolm. 
uh, even up to this date. And we talk about in the book how it's wrong to look at the events and happenings outside the proper framework, which is a religious and spiritual framework. And that becomes important because number one, in religious communities, people see one another as extended members of a family. We're not dealing with members of a political party. So there's a plot over here and there's a, a, a coup being uh, staged over here. In religious and spiritual communities, we have a overarching uh, uh, atmosphere and concept of one another as family. Now, in families, sometimes we fall out of love with each other. In families, sometimes we ain't on speaking terms. And sometimes in families, we're trading insults with one another. Yes, sir. <laughs> and so often it is also in families that when two members of a family don't speak to each other and are hostile to each other, if they separate from each other many times, time can heal the wound. Many times they come back around and they remember the love that they had for each other and they reconcile. This is why in the religion of Islam, if a husband and wife are having problems and they separate, no outside man or woman is permitted to interfere because the hope of the Islamic community is that this won't proceed toward divorce, but it will come back to a natural reconciliation. Well, when Malcolm and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad became estranged from one another, the FBI saw an opportunity. They had been targeting Brother Malcolm. They had been working to separate him from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In fact, in the book, we include the transcript of an, a, a conversation that Malcolm recorded when he was be he was under suspension from the nation the fbi came calling and they were deliberately saying you know malcolm we just wanted to come and basically check your pulse check your temperature to see if you know you want to get down with us and then you know we can we can take down elijah mm -hmm. and to brother malcolm's credit he rebuffed them you know but i'm thankful that he recorded them because it shows that they were deliberately interested in the destruction of the movement of Islam in America among black people, particularly the nation of Islam. And so Malcolm was a target of a larger movement that they wanted to get rid of. And so we go through this extensively uh, in the book. Uh, and we also talk about for the first time, I don't know any other authors that have gone into the hand of the ADL in their working in concert with J. Edgar Hoover's FBI uh, and how they were also party to the elements which were pieced together to bring about the assassination of Brother Minister Malcolm X. Uh, those who get the book know that there's a very bold and profound quote on the back cover of the book because as you know, much ado was made about the relationship of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his secretaries. Yes, sir. Well, we were able to have a conversation with the secretary of Brother Minister Malcolm and her testimony proved to be very, very powerful because she testified that the day that Malcolm was assassinated, he was going to share with his audience the conclusions that he had drawn, that the attempts being made on his life did not come from the nation. And so it is my belief that since he was being so heavily surveilled and spied upon that those who were uh, organizing the assassination felt that they had to do it that day. Uh, and he was also going to reveal a plan uh, for black people to take over Harlem, which would have been uh, injurious to the Jewish merchants who predominated in the black communities of Harlem during that period of time. Uh, so there's a lot of new information in our book. There's a lot of fresh perspective in our book. And there is for the first time a published 
and well documented with over 400 sources, a record of a vindication of the nation. And this is the first time this has happened in 55 years. And we're very grateful to a lot that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan blessed us with approving this work. He read every page of it. And uh, we've had long conversations about it and he loves it. So I hope that you will go to our website, researchminister.com, order it, uh, order multiple copies, share with young people because the formula and the ingredients that produced Malcolm X are from the nation of Islam. And they are still available to transform the life of any young man or young woman. But if the youth believe that the nation killed their hero, they'll never come and get that which the hero got that made him a hero in the first place. So we have to work to educate our youth to learn the truth of history such that they would see the great ones of the past and the present as those whom their life is purpose to go and sit at their feet, drink their wisdom, and then get up and say, I'll take the baton and carry and run my leg of the race as we move our people toward ultimate freedom and liberation. Yes, sir. Well, family, there you have it. You have the website to the book. Could you get a website one more time, uh, Brother Demetrius? Yes, so that sir. yes, sir. Purchase that. We want to purchase as many books as possible. We want to spread this new information, this uh, new uh, fresh breadth of perspective uh, to our people because it's very much needed. So could you give them the uh, place where they can purchase the book and where uh, they can just stay up to date on uh, everything that you're doing, um, the work that you're doing as well, all your social media and things like that. Yes, sir. Uh, definitely the book. Uh, all of our books can be found on researchminister.com. Um, I'm on Instagram, uh, Brother Dimitri, Facebook, Dimitri Muhammad, Twitter as well as Brother Dimitri. Uh, you can reach out to us there. Uh, you can get some of our titles on Amazon. Uh, but the Malcolm book is exclusively available on researchminister.com. And so, uh, you know, you can you can check us out there. Follow us. Keep up with the work that we're trying to do of uh, shedding uh, the light on the darkness of, of the falsehood. And uh, as we continue the work of helping to vindicate the noble name and person of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this this was so good, Brother Demetri. We're going to have to do a part two. We can we definitely do a part two, my brother. Yes, sir. And get in depth in that book, brother. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, again, we would like to thank you uh, for blessing us with your um, your time and uh, allowing uh, us to have you on this platform to deliver that powerful information, brother. And uh, you, you know, brother. can't wait for next uh, for part two. We're gonna go ahead and set that up immediately yes, so we can yes, add it for, uh, for the people. Yes, sir. Sounds good, my brother. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, you're certainly welcome. Thank you, sir. All right, family. Peace. Peace.